this had better be important. Yes, sir. The American agent has infiltrated the X lab facility. Back to the combat footage show or the drone footage show. I'm not sure what it's going to be uh, after tonight. But hit the like button, drop a comment in the chat. We're back. It's good to see you. Happy Monday. Where are you at? Germany. Hey, what's that camo? We'll talk about it here in a second. <clears throat> Richmond, Virginia. I was just there. Yeah. Welcome in. <coughs> Excuse me. From Montreal, how are you? Jersey. What's up? Virginia, Jacksonville, the UK, Philly, Middle Tennessee, Michigan. Hello from Pennsylvania. Hello from Pennsylvania. Hi, Pennsylvania. I'm Dad. Uh, 20 push-ups for each minute. What? Listen. I was trying to finish my canned margarita before the show. I'm not kidding. Uh, I bought them a while ago, and you know, I've been kind of chipping away at them. And, uh, yeah, that's what I was doing while I was prepping the stream. But anyway, uh, welcome back to the Combat Footage Show. Tonight's going to be probably a little bit longer than normal Monday shows. Uh, under a lot of circumstances, the Monday show is... You know, a shorter recap of all the footage that we found from over the weekend. Uh, but there was a lot of footage from over the weekend. There are a lot of areas that we're going to touch tonight. We'll see footage from uh, Israel, focusing really heavily on um, some activity in Lebanon. Uh, then we're going to touch on just one series of videos from the West Bank, but that's going to be some heavy stuff once we get there. Uh, we'll eventually make our way into Gaza, where we'll focus pretty sp pretty heavily on Khan Yunus, uh, and then into Ukraine, where we'll kind of bounce around the map there as well. But, excuse me, I do have to take a moment to mention our sponsor for tonight's tonight's show, uh, Venture Surplus. If you guys are into mil -surp, military surplus gear, uh, or for those of you out there that went to turn in a piece of gear and realized that it has been it was lost in the field 10 years ago and you uh, yeah, you might just happen to find it on Venture Surplus. You guys have a code for that. I use the same code for this my Whoopi hoodie, because I don't really have a need for any gear. I've got more gear that than I can you know, ever really do with. They've got pouches, backpacks. Uh, I just happened to see on the front page that they have $20 Whoobies. Um, anyway, we, we thank Venture Surplus very much for sponsoring the show. Uh, the way we do this show, it kind of leaves us wide open to demonetization by YouTube. Uh, I appreciate your patience in allowing us to talk a little bit about those that want to you know, sponsor the show because it helps quite a bit. So consider giving them a look. There's a link in the stream description pinned in the comments as well. Uh, VentureSurplus.com. Use the code. It's going to be down there in the bottom left of your screen. Just about the entire show tonight. Funky 10. But anyway, let's get started for the night. I was going to show you guys the website and all that stuff. But um, at this point, I'm, I'm hoping that you know how to use Google. We're going to get started by talking a little bit about Lebanon. I'm going to pull up the Institute for the Study of Wars map. Uh, and yes, I did get this from them. You know, again, got good stuff over there. I, I will be getting, just to kind of round that thought out, uh, since I still don't need gear and they still wanted me to, you know, go over and take a look at what I wanted, they have the North American Rescue medical kits. And uh, I actually ran into an issue this weekend, just for a little anecdote, I ran into an issue this weekend where I had everything that I needed from a trauma perspective, but my daughter got a little bumped and bruised and I didn't have, um, you know, things as prepared, just being transparent with you, from like a little scrapes and cuts perspective. So I'll probably probably be updating my uh, vehicle trauma kit by picking up one of the North American Rescue um, different IFACs that they have over there. Anyway, let's head to the map. Like I mentioned, we're going to be focusing pretty heavily on Lebanon to start the night. Uh, given that this is a combat footage show, you know, there's a lot of video that I run into, you know, in the process of preparing the show that never ends up making the light of day here. Now, why is that? Let's talk about that for a second, right? Why don't you show 
you know, uh, this, that, or the other. Well, this is the combat footage show. I try to show things as often as possible, uh, specifically related to and hopefully in the midst of combat. Every so often, we'll provide some contextual video and footage, uh, but that's something that I kind of wanted to talk about right out of the gate. You know, I see that question a lot. I see that comment a lot. When it comes to ground combat, maneuver, uh, I try to limit the amount of drone footage that we're watching. I think everybody at this point is used to seeing drones. But when it comes to that ground combat, that, you know, helmet cam footage, or even drone footage that provides like this macro level overview of the battle space, that's the kind of stuff that I really want to show you completely off topic from what we're talking about here. We're going to talk about another high level assassination that took place. And I'm going to take you over to Google Earth for, for a general idea of where this took place. And I say a general idea because uh, there's actually a little bit of back and forth on which specific Salem it was. Now, it, was, it either took place at uh, this Salem. The, the, that thing is in the way, so I can't really see that. Uh, Maj Majdal Salem or over near Kerbet Salem. Now, the individual specifically that we're going to talk about, let's talk about him. This dude's name was Wissam Al-Tawil. He's actually kind of a prominent guy. He rubbed a lot of shoulders with um, Soleimani, the IR IRGC commander that was killed uh, quite a few years ago at this point by the U.S. But here is the aftermath of that strike on his vehicle. I'll show you a picture of he and Soleimani here in a second. This took place in Lebanon. I don't think that's going to buff out. His role, though, his role, he was one of the commanders, not the commander. I originally, when I when I ran across this one, uh, was led to believe that he was the commander, but he's not. He's just one commander associated with the al Haj Radwan uh, faction. Uh, I shouldn't say faction, the uh, Radwan. These guys are effectively kind of the Sof of Hezbollah. They do deep infiltration of Israel, um, and they got a lot of their experience out of Syria. So... Some are looking at this as some level of an escalation or, or an even deeper escalation than the assassination that we witnessed last week. I'm not really here to tell you whether it is or not. I'm here to tell you that it happened. And based on the current state, that is the information that I have. That's also not necessarily news information. That's just the context around the video that I was able to find. But I want to shift off of that and talk about this Lebanese civilian. Uh, nearly getting smoked. Literally. Oof. These are smoke rounds. It's artillery-based. A lot of misinformation gets thrown around when, when you see these things getting used. Um, you know, see, you'll see everything from, like, white phosphorus um, to tear gas. You know, that's, you know, quite... And when I say white phosphorus, there are smoke rounds that use phosphorus as, from a smoke perspective, you know, because it emits that chalky white smoke. And these could very, very well be that. But the context that I'm using phosphorus in is more the uh, as a um, flammable, right, uh, which would be controlled by the convention on certain conventional weapons. But he got pretty lucky here. Got to catch that next time. Somewhere near the Lebanese border. I skipped over an entire section and I didn't realize it. Somewhere near the Lebanese border. We'll, we'll circle to that right after this. An Apache was able to take down a Hezbollah drone. In it. Whoa, we are up. Boom. Hey, free. Would it have killed him? Probably. Almost undoubtedly.
À la Pachi Israeli Apache, correct. Now, in Lebanon, Israel continues to strike against Lebanese Hezbollah. This is going to be... We oftentimes get official releases from the IDF on the strikes that they're conducting. We're going to watch one here in a second. But we don't too often see really clear footage from a witness perspective. That's what we have here. Now, these could be JDAM. They could be Spike. Spike's been used pretty heavily by the IDF, at least in Gaza. We deep dove that a few streams back. What's difficult to know when you have footage like this, though, uh, what's difficult to do is, is correlate that with a, an official release with some kind of a press statement that says, you know, here's what this was targeting or here's who it was against. But here is an official release from the IDF. Now, this was reportedly in response to rockets that were, fi that were fired from this location by Hezbollah. All right, let's come back up. I want to circle back to something. Something that I've been following more at face value uh, than in depth. It's been the attacks against U.S. bases. Now, that's not to say I haven't been following it. Uh, what, I, what I currently don't have, though, is kind of a layout and breakdown of all of those that have happened and each individual response because the U.S. has responded. And I actually want to give you my thoughts on that for a, spec for a second, because there's this running narrative right now that the U.S. isn't responding. The U.S. is probably about two weeks in between each of their strikes, whether they're striking back in Syria, uh, striking back in Iraq. They're about two weeks between each of those. Uh, now, during that two weeks, uh, multiple small Shahed drones are being flown into U.S. bases. And in fact, we I want to say we covered one that took place... Uh, right around Christmas that really severely injured three uh, American service members. Now, that two weeks in between, I can tell you from being a part of the intelligence collection cycle, that is actually not a lot of time. Uh, the collection cycle typically takes quite a long time, especially when you're not uh, in a, you know, war, warring state. Uh, the contingents that we have in Iraq and Syria, they're, they're kind of skeleton crew bare bones, and they're really there to be a thorn in the side of both ISIS uh, and in uh, against Iranian uh, influence in the area. So that two-week gap there, you're going to have everything from target identification to ISR soak or uh, drone soaks. So you'll, you'll have um, ISR assets that'll just fly over that area and stare at it. How many civilians are coming and going? How many, you know, potential uh, fighters are coming and going? And two weeks is actually, you know, a strike every two weeks or so against some pretty strategic locations kind of makes sense from an op-tempo perspective. That being said, here's some footage of CRAM on an undisclosed base, or it might not be undisclosed, but on a base in Iraq that got to eat a little bit against uh, an Iranian drone. I should say Iranian manufactured drone piloted by uh, Iranian backed Iraqis. Oh shit. I mean, this could be Erbil. Not entirely certain where exactly it is. Oh, shit. I meant to cover this one right before we talked about the, the assassination. One more for the burp sound. Oh, 
All right. We're going to be headed to the West Bank, okay? Uh, we only have footage from one location to talk about in the West Bank, and I'm going to be going over to the Funker 530 Twitter to talk about it. Now, this took place in Tulkarm. In Tulkarm, there was a very close quarters battle between armed Palestinians, uh, because I don't have a great affiliation. Uh, it wasn't reported any specific inf affiliation with the armed Palestinians that we're going to watch and the IDF. We're going to see two perspectives. We're going to see one perspective uh, from a CCTV camera, one of two CCTV cameras from inside the wall. You'll understand what I'm talking about here in a second. Uh, and then we'll see another perspective from outside the wall. I'm going to talk more about this as the video goes along, but there were effectively, once again, two versions of this, uh, well, two separate videos from the same spot being shared around. Three, if you count the second perspective from outside the wall. But this first video, we combined the two perspectives, and I think you'll understand why we did. I have to warn you, discretion is advised, because for all intents and purposes, what you're about to see here is against just about uh, it's, it's against the IHL, it's against the Geneva Convention, at least a certain part of it. But here it comes. This took place in Tulkarm, West Bank. So, what you just watched were uh, armed and unarmed Palestinians that went to exit this compound for whatever reason. Some were armed, some appear to not have been armed. This is one of those rifles. Discretion advised. It, it continues. What you're seeing now is the IDF peek around this corner. They were very, very close. Now let's pause here for a second, because I know I mentioned something that's going to probably have the chat roll, and I mentioned the, the, the word war crime. I want to take us back to, to some things that I've talked about kind of repeatedly. Just talking about war crimes doesn't necessarily mean <clears throat> we are crying about them. It's important to talk about them. We have yet to see one. Uh, whether armed or unarmed, there is an important distinction with the targeting of unarmed civilians. You have to be able to differentiate upon engagement that they are unarmed. If you have one armed guy and one unarmed guy run around a corner on you, and they are close enough to have each other's hands in their pockets, and you engage the armed guy, and the unarmed guy gets hit, for all intents and purposes, that is not a war crime. We have not seen that yet. What we're about to see, though, would be considered mutilation of a dead body. This is where the second video is being shared around. Um, this second part is what we added to this video. The second part of the video was the one that went more viral. Here's the rest of it. Discretion advised. You have one deceased here, same location. Note the position of the legs. Uh, this is some time later, and this is a second video that's making its way that's a little bit more viral around social media right now. Now let's go all the way back because I see the comments about what the chest rig is an unarmed. Some of these individuals are not armed, nor are they wearing chest rigs. This being one. He might, I'm, I don't know. You know, we're looking. Always important to note, I am giving you the context that I have specific to the video. I'm not trying to lead you one way or another. I am telling you what I see when I look at the video.
Now, there's a second perspective of this. We're not going to we're not going to dwell too long on it. And that second perspective gives us an eye of what was happening outside of that wall. The view that the IDF had up to the engagement. Uh, we don't have the CCTV recording from the second part of the last video. Here you are. So they roll in in this, you know, non-tactical vehicle. This is the IDF that's getting out of it right now. Let's bring it back up <clears throat> and we'll pause and we'll pause for a second. So again, and like I've talked about when it comes to the footage from the war in Ukraine, crimes in war will happen. <clears throat> it's important to talk about them when they do, and it shouldn't be shocking that crimes in war happen, crimes relative to the law of armed conflict, but they should still be shocking to see. That is the ultimate brutal reality of war and showing, discussing, and being aware of those things happening uh, is what's important. Now, there are uh, investigative processes that theoretically should happen following that IDF vehicle running over the Palestinian, whether they were armed or otherwise. Um, but if you go back into the annals of history and you think about uh, the tanks of World War II as they rolled down the streets littered with American, German, uh, Russian bodies that were run over. Those things have happened before. That doesn't take away the horror of it. You know, it's not something that you'd like to see. But again, that's why war is gross. And it's brutal. And this is that reality. Let's move on, though. That's the only thing I had from the West Bank. And again, that was Tulkarm. We are headed uh, to Google Earth because we're starting to get into my geolocatable footage. We're headed to here in central Gaza City. Now, if we head over to the ISW map, You'll see that the envelopment continues with these pockets of areas that the IDF has still yet to clear. The one we're about to view actually looks like it's kind of in this supposedly cleared area. Let's go back to Google Earth here. Ronnie might get in trouble for showing that. Um, uh, let's, talk, let's talk about that for a second. There, there's a reason we tell you guys to download the app. First of all, uh, I'm not going to get sent to the principal's office for covering that, but that's the kind of thing we absolutely should cover because what does that show us? That shows the brutal reality, right? The same thing when we covered uh, the instance of perfidy that ultimately led to the Ukrainians killing uh, the would-be Russian POWs. That is the ultimate reality of why the war crime perfidy exists. But that's what we're here for. That's why this show, every time we do it, is ultimately a risk. And that's why we ask, if you guys would like to support us, download the app. Consider becoming a pro member, right? That's why we're building the independence that we have. That's why we don't upload raw footage here anymore. That's why people will say, Funker's not the same. It's because we see the writing on the wall. That if you don't put yourself inside of one of these boxes, and or if you do put yourself inside of a box, and it's not the box that big media wants you to be in, you're going to be shut down. And we're not, 
If it happens, it happens. That's why we have the app. That's why we have the website. Sorry to derail. Let's go back to the footage. So again, we're going to be about here. That looks, I don't want to say close enough, but it looks like it's really right in this area there. This is a Hamas release, though, which is going to show them continuing to use RPGs, close quarters with Merkavas. It will also show towards the end, if this is the video that I'm thinking it is, uh, what appears to be a blood-soaked floor with Israeli tourniquets all over it. The implication or inference there is that their uh, ambushes were effective. Here's the footage from Hamas at that location. Pause. I see a comment in the chat. There's getting to be more and more side banter rather than the videos. There's about to be more because I've talked about this before. The reason that I am here is to try and stay inside of the boundaries of YouTube. Their boundaries are that I'm technically supposed to be on the screen at all times. Right? So this is our attempt, YouTube, at providing context to the footage. Don't watch or go to the website and watch it raw. If you don't want to see my stupid face, you don't have to. Here's the footage. It buffered. That might be the first time I've seen the sour cream and onion and the nacho Dorito being used at once there. So this is, this is that section that I was speaking to. And if you note, they're going to zoom in on, I don't know, some kind of like a nameplate or something here that has Hebrew on it. The inference to something like that is success. Uh, but, you know, continu continuing to note that in the majority of these, quote, official releases, I didn't make sure, I did mute myself for the second um, because I had to cough. I had to make sure that I wasn't muted. 
But I'm continuing to note in these official releases that we still don't see a lot of aftermath on the RPG strikes against the Merkava. That is not, <clears throat> once again, don't put me in a box. That is not me saying that the Merkavas haven't been hit, mission killed, or destroyed. That's me saying that we have no idea, and neither do you. How many have been taken out of action on a mission or mobility kill, or how many have been destroyed? Let's move on, though. Speaking of ISR soaks, we're going to see one take place here with a follow-up strike. We're moving already down in, down towards Kanyunis here. Towards. Not quite there yet, but moving south. We're going to see uh, ISR, a drone of some kind, um, essentially following what is reported to be Hamas militants. That is the official report and is the only context that I have outside of the location here. They do get struck. Someone's asking if there's a way to send fan art. Uh, th I think the easiest way would just be tagging us on Twitter. Sorry, missed that. I need to check in on the support and thank you guys for it. The Wooby. We'll talk about the Wooby again here in probably about 15 minutes. Oh, we're watching it again. I was reading through the reading through the chat. I was hanging out with you. Uh, let's go through the support and thank you guys very much for it. Uh, Rowan, thank you for the twelve fifty six. Hey, what's up, Ronnie? Been having a social media detox. Good for you. Hell yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, I hear congratulations are in order for you and Mrs. Ronnie. There are yeah, and I appreciate it very much. We welcomed the fifth fifth member of our fire team here in the house. So I guess that makes us over fire team size. Now we're working on squad size. Yeah. Establish your own internal fire teams. That way you can do family bonding stuff uh, like the Wolverines did. Wolverines. Uh, thank you very much for the 1256. Taco Dell, thank you for the five bucks. Love the show as always. Any advice for a father to be, uh, specifically a girl dad to be? Uh, thanks for all you do. Yes, actually. Uh, and I don't, I don't mean to like, you know, take that very seriously, but something that I had to learn, I grew up, uh, I did have a sister, you know, she passed early, uh, very early. So I was very young, but I grew up an only child, uh, and had a very blue collar childhood dad that raised me. And, um, in the way most dads do, it was, it was a rough and tumble, you know, style of correction. It took me not having a gauge outside of that uh, uh, probably a little bit too long to have a little bit softer of a voice when it came to, you know, corrective discussion. I would say as a girl dad, kind of have to go about things a little bit differently. I'd recommend that right out of the gate. Uh, thank you for the 10, Dr. Doctor. And for the two before that, Dr. Doctor. Viking, thank you for the 628. Jonathan, thank you for the five. Uh, good morning, member. Welcome to Costco. I love you. All right. We're moving into Khan Yunus. This is a really interesting video that we have here. We've seen plenty of footage of the IDF, and we're going to see some more of it tonight, doing controlled detonations. One little piece of footage that we saw, <clears throat> either just this past Friday or maybe even the stream right before that, indicated that the IDF was using anti-tank mines as a part of their demo. Well, it appears as though that is correct. Here is footage of the IDF demolishing <clears throat> that building using what appear to be anti-tank mines. I got to keep the sound off, though.
Unfortunately, this was filmed in vertical or edited in vertical aspect ratio. I have a, 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 a controlled deck coming up here in about three more videos that isn't. Uh, some helmet camera footage here, official release from the IDF as they move through Khan Yunus. I'm about to crank this volume and give you the real experience. Well, of course, right when the sound cuts out. So that showed the setup of some of those demo charges. I've got some more helmet camera footage released by the IDF here, also in Khan Yunus, uh, but I think we have some Merkava stuff in here as well. Yeah, we do. Coming up now. didn't uh, unmute myself there. This is an interesting one. This is this is really one of those contextual type videos, also in Khan Yunus. It's going to be uh, witness footage, so civilian recorded. Let's bring it back out here just so you can see where we are. Of Palestinians kind of um, standing around as rounds are flying right overhead. Just, I mean... These rounds, some of these rounds are close. Here is that controlled debt I promised you. What's interesting on this one is it looks like they're using loom rounds, so illumination. Uh, and this one was in that uh, last video, and it, it still is vertically, you know, vertical aspect ratio. But it's a it's a just a better better video of it. Um, what's interesting though is they're using illumination rounds. Uh, anyway, well. Uh, okay, fine. All right. We're moving into the general section. Uh, let me check in over here on the support and thank you guys for it. We got about five more minutes, and then we'll talk about the Wobby hoodie. I see plenty of questions about that. Uh, Skull Fenrir, where do I send my adoption papers to join your squad, Dad? Uh, you'll do that at funker530.com slash pro. That's where you would theoretically do that. And thank you for the $5, sir. Uh, Brand Official Entertainment, thanks for the $2. Had to check the mute button. 
I'm late, but uh, now here, I restarted it. I'll catch up. Sounds good. Sounds good. And thank you guys very much for it. Mission Your Mom, thank you very much for the $5. Keep up the great work. Any thoughts on what's ahead for Southern Gaza? Uh, yeah, I have thoughts. It would be you know a little bit of speculation with plenty of single source bits of reporting, but I think that's a deeper conversation, you know, uh, subject to whether or not some of that single source reporting ever turns out to be true because it's kind of inflammatory, you know. But we're moving into the IDF general, well, the war in Gaza's general section. I don't know where this stuff took place. But it's starting with this video from Hamas. Setting up a rocket launch site. Here. I like just I know I'm sorry that I'm stopping the video I'm sorry but I like that I like how scientific he's being about like the angles here you know I don't know. Here we are. Oh, got a lemon pepper Dorito there. Do you see that? Lemon pepper. All right, so here's the first thing that comes to mind when I see this, you know, just to take it to a serious note for a second. There's a lot of comments that, not saying in, in, all, in all cases they're unfounded, but there are a lot of comments of, why did Israel destroy the whole building? Well, what the f*** is this? If they're, if they're setting up rocket launch sites by drilling holes through the wall, or I don't know, sledgehammering holes through the wall, the entire building is the launch site. I'm not saying that applies to every instance, but you don't know how many times something like that applies to the, these times that the IDF dropped a spike 2000 on top of something's roof. You don't. And to say and to say that you do is false. Let's move on. More Hamas release footage. Coming up for you guys now. Knew it had to happen once. It had to happen once. It hasn't happened in weeks, but here we are. I didn't unmute myself, but here we go. This is an interesting video. I don't know what border or what checkpoint this takes place at, but you're going to see two Israeli security guards that get run up on uh, by a uh, Palestinian armed with a knife. Um, well, the video kind of cuts a couple times and we think that's because that's not something we did we think that's because of the gunfire i don't know if concussion from that or uh, you know I'm, I'm not sure why so the the initial engagement 
of the Palestinian with a knife uh, isn't really caught. Uh, the follow-up engagement after the Palestinian grabs an M4 is caught on video, sort of. But discretion is advised on this. What you're going to see is a Palestinian armed with a knife attack two security guards, and they don't allow him to do that. Here you are. I don't know if she, like, on her way out the door there, you know, tossed one more. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, now somewhere along the line, probably underneath of the desk, was their M4. going on with that uh I didn't see this when I reviewed this earlier is her tether ah that's her gun tether attached to her handgun dragging it across the floor so she's got like a um a tether attached to you know, her handgun from a weapon retention perspective. You can actually see it wrapped around her leg right there. But I thought it was like some Matrix stuff for a second. West Bank, not entirely certain. That's why it's in this section. The rest of the video is effectively, you know, this, this man dying. And whatever's going on here. It's just kind of holding... All right, bringing it back up. One more Hamas video. Then we're going to take an intermission. I'll, well, I'll still be here for it, but anyway. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save you from the dialogue, and we're going to talk for a second about willy-nilly sending mortars a general that away. Just a general that away. Here you are. Talking, talking, talking. Lemon pepper Dorito. If I'm not mistaken, just so you know what he's talking about, if if I recall, I'm not. I'm just telling you what I recall. Uh, I believe that this guy Hamas was sending uh, praise of some kind to those in Iraq that were rising up against U.S. forces there, I, I believe. I, I think I'm close. Uh, the spread on that shotgun that I just threw at that topic is close enough. Something about Iraq. Here's the footage. What he's doing right now is removing the, removing the site. And it all went awry. Right there. So let's, listen, we're going to chat about this for a second. Whatever he used that optic for, to sight in on that initial, if he sighted in on anything in the first place, I don't, I'm not certain. Whatever he used that for, he's got two bag charges on that. All, all goes out the window. As soon as he drops that second round. I'm not a mortarman. I'm an intel to weed. That was, that was my role. Uh, I never actually did that in Afghanistan. I did other stuff. But I talked with, with Will about this. Will. Kilmore. Uh, he is a former U.S. Army mortarman, a Purple Heart recipient, one of our writers, um, and he provided a whole ton of, in, uh, of insight. Let's watch the video and we'll talk more about it. That thing shifts back about, you know, six, seven, eight inches. And then he continues to drop rounds through it. Each one of those subsequent rounds, it continues to move. Those are going to be hundreds of meters off at their destination. Hundreds of meters. Those could end up landing short and hitting some kindergarten or a hospital. Really anywhere. The, part, the point about the two bag charges, right? If they were 
uh, if there were no charges and he was just lobbing these into, you, you know, across the street or something, they're all going to land pretty close. Uh, you know, it's not going to be your, your, your impact area is not going to be too wide. But with those two bag charges, those two charges on there, those things are moving, you know, some distance. That would be like, what, a 60 millimeter mortar can go, according to Will, up to about two kilometers or so. Um, the impact area on those, no idea. No idea. First round would have been generally accurate based on whatever they cited in the mortar. But every every round after that would have been off by an abhorrent margin. We're going to pause here for a second and uh, check in on the chat. And thank you very much for it. Uh, Daddy Ronnie, where do babies come from? Well, according to my mom, the stork, but you know, based on current experience, um, I'm starting to disagree with her. Thank you very much for the 10. Thomas, thank you for the 215. Uh, Treasure X, thank you very much about the two bucks. Uh, but why care about the conventions? I, I don't know. I, I didn't say that I personally did. Again, this is, this is kind of what I was talking about is me saying that according to the law of armed conflict, that is a war crime, doesn't necessarily mean I am decrying what's happening. Because I think from a from a logic perspective, I have come to terms with the fact that in war, these atrocities, right, what would be labeled as atrocities, are just going to happen, right? Talking about them, I think, is important, understanding the reality there. Uh, but I have come to, to terms with the fact that no matter what side, what box you're in, what side you're on or what box you're in, the brutal reality is still going to take place. War doesn't change. Only the tools that it's waged with do. Uh, Quo, thank you very much for the five bucks. Uh, Mission Your Mom, thanks again for the five. Uh, Velox, thanks for hitting the member button. I appreciate that. I got to take a second before we get into our Ukraine footage that I have for the night and thank our sponsor. So it does matter very much to us when folks step out to sponsor the stream. By and large, based on the footage that you guys have even just seen tonight, uh, YouTube doesn't really, doesn't really, we don't play well in the sandbox with YouTube. Um, and we appreciate very much when, when, you know, people decide to sponsor us. Venture Surplus. If you guys are into mill surp gear or something cool like this Whoopi hoodie, 100% got it from them. We've talked about it before. I've worn it before. Uh, check out Venture Surplus. They've got everything from Alice Packs to <clears throat> North American Rescue uh, IFAX, that's actually what I'm picking up with the code. Uh, the code is FUNKY10, saves you 10% over there. Uh, if you just wanted a Wooby, they're like 20 bucks, then you use that 10% code, get a little bit of money back. Anyway, thanks very much to Venture Surplus for sponsoring the stream. We're going to move into the Ukraine section that we have tonight, and we're going to be starting in Hearson. I saw a comment in the chat earlier, something akin to Big Boom or Big Shockwave. Welcome to the drone footage show. Let's head to Deep State. Take a look at the campaign map. Our very first video is gonna gonna have us down here in Harrison. I want to say it's somewhere in this area here. I'll pull it up on uh, Google uh, Google Earth here in just a second. But at this location, F11. Thank you. For some reason, I closed Google Earth. Talk amongst yourselves. Oof. Earth. At this location, a BM-21 grad, a Russian BM-21 grad, ends up cooking off after what was reported to be counter-battery fires. Here. Let's bring it back out. How close was I? I think I nailed it. Uh, Yeah, I was kind of close. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, look at that. Just better. BM-21 grad. With a very catastrophic failure after, again, what was reported to be counter-battery fires. Video's coming up now. I think it's. I think this video's been slowed down. Uh, it's. It doesn't really detract from this, though. Well, that's the actual strike itself.
All right. Let's head to Krinky, where Ukraine still maintains that bridgehead on the left bank. We're headed to here. That's not the right geo coordinates. But this takes place in Krinky. My bad on the geo. I'll see if I can go and grab those while we're watching the footage here. Here it is. Uh, it is going to be an FPV strike on a Russian tank. Got the coordinates. And it's gone. Let me show you where on the uh, map that is. Took place here. So all of those blown out areas that you're seeing here. Here. You've got kind of a, what would that be, northern-ish? No, southern perspective. You're looking to the south, which makes sense because we're watching this from the perspective of a Ukrainian drone. All right. I don't have anything significant from Zaporzhia. There was some footage there, but it was largely just uh, some artillery, some more FPV drone strikes. We're going to see a few more of those. Um, uh, I, I think by the end of this, you'll kind of ha have had your fill of FPV strikes. At least I did preparing the stream tonight. Um, but I didn't, I didn't see anything overly, overly significant from, you know, a forward line of troops change from a maneuver perspective. You know, if there was some kind of um, Russian advance or Ukrainian adv advance, I, I would have, you know, pulled that footage. But there, I didn't see anything of that nature. Uh, in Bakhmut, I found some interesting footage uh, along the line of drone defense, which is a topic uh, that you really can't discuss enough right now. Uh, this is AAA fire against, uh, or from Ukraine's 93rd Mechanized Brigade against uh, Russian drones just outside of Bakhmut. We're moving into Donetsk here. I think that it's by drone. Это новый фестиваль, блядь, рок-музыки. Up. I kind of lost my place because I was scrolling through. Oh, there we are. We're headed to Marinka next. Uh, let's go back to Deep State. That way we can kind of reset where we are. Get into it. There's Avdivka. All right. Here we are. Uh, so on the Deep State map, <clears throat> we're moving to, I want to say this is just outside of Marinka. Uh, there was some there was some reporting from uh, kind of pro-Russian accounts that uh, they continue to advance and they have you know according to Deep State this is one of the reasons that I really like Deep State but that the um, next offensive is going to be for this next small town which would you know make a whole lot of sense but what we're going to see here is actually a Ukrainian T-72 being destroyed by a Russian FPV drone. Matter of fact, let's go over to Google Earth and we'll get an exact location on where this tank is. Uh, of course, I keep closing Google Earth. I don't know why I keep doing that. 
There's a theme for t- for tonight's Ukraine section. I think you're starting to pick up on it. Here. So that is very much so inside of that next village. This is where that's going to take place, though. Ukrainian T-72 being destroyed by a Russian FPV. Maybe. Internet's acting weird. Oh, there we go. Coming up for you now. So the, one of the reasons I wanted to show you this is we continue to see one and done videos of FPV drones hitting tanks. Well, before we get to this portion, which we will watch here in a second, what we just saw is we saw three FPV drones flown into the back of the turret uh, or even lower of this tank. Now, the back of tanks is just, you know, colloquially or that's not the right word commonly understood as one of its most vulnerable areas. It took three just for the T-72. Something to know. Hit it back up. Moving into Avdivka. Another Ukrainian tank. Here. That gets destroyed. And this is some inter- this is really interesting footage because it took me took me a little bit of time. It's it's thermal, right? So we're we're watching this from an FPV drone's perspective. And I couldn't, for the life of me, understand what was happening after the tank was hit. Uh, But I'll walk you through it. At least I'll walk you through my understanding of what we're seeing on the video while we're watching. Coming up for you now. This is a Ukrainian vehicle. Ukrainian tank. And it's going to get hit by artillery. First round lands behind, I think. Second round, I, I want to say, nails it. Maybe that front left corner. But at some point, it does get abandoned. <clears throat> and it looks like the crew might move to one of these two houses. Now, the only reason I believe the crew may have moved to one of those two houses is this appears to be a Russian team moving to inspect the tank. I'll take you back to the map here in a second, but you are looking into right now from this direction towards these houses. I'm a simpleton, so it took me entirely too long to understand what I was seeing here. And this is the part that confused me. Is they just launched some kind, probably an RPG of some kind, 
at one of those houses. I don't know if they took contact from the house, if the crew is embedded in there in that house now. Or if they're just sending around, sending rockets when they do propel themselves, I'll talk about that here in a little bit, into just about anything close. From a freedom of movement perspective, it doesn't, you know, this guy's kind of, walking around playing pocket pool. It doesn't look like they're under, they're in contact at all. And that was what was most confusing about watching this for me. All right, coming up. We've got Russia on the receiving end of some drone dropped munitions. As we get into some of these drone drops, I just want to give you kind of that top down overview um, discretion advised. We're going to see some really nasty ones tonight um, because there's a theme again. But this next video takes place here in Evdivka. I think it's Stepova. Yeah. So we're on that northern axis of Evdivka. Where we've seen lots of Bradley footage, uh, no update. I did see the question in the chat earlier. It was much earlier in the show, uh, in the stream. You know, have we heard an update on the White Bradley? I, I haven't, and I haven't seen any footage of the, quote, White Bradley since uh, the last time we showed some footage. But these are going to be Russians on the receiving end of drone-dropped grenades. I don't cover a whole lot of this stuff. But I think every so often it's kind of important, as is the theme tonight, as a reminder that uh, drones are terrifying. Discretion advised. Bring it up. One more from Evdivka. I don't know. I don't have a geolocation and I couldn't confirm where in Evdivka this is, especially given that it's under thermal. Uh, but it is Russian film footage of Ukrainians on the receiving end of drone drop munitions. And it again, it's under thermal. So I don't know unless you're the original source or you have contact with the original. Anyway, here's the footage. Discretion's advised on this one. Should have given you that earlier, regardless of if it's thermal or not. All right. From Luhansk, uh, last Friday, I want to say it was last Friday. Where was that? Was it Abdivka? 
Novo Mikhailovka, Novo Salivsky, Salivske. I'm trying. I'm not sure where it was, but we watched another MTLB vehicle born IED. And one of the suggestions or one of the things that I agree with as um, you know, a possible justification for use of VBIEDs and MTLBs for Russia uh, would be mine clearance. Well, moving all the way up into Luhansk, we have what looks like another VBIED. We're going here. Let's head there on Deep State so you can see some forward line of troops. Hello? Okay. Let's try and take a digit out of that. See if it wants to give us a location. Nope, doesn't want to do it. That's fine. But that's where we're headed. Big boom. Assumed to be a VBIED. Quote, do they not just hear the drone? So that's that's a lot of the line of thinking that myself and Josh used to have is, you know, you hear, me. where do you go? Where are you going to go? The drone's faster than you. There's nowhere to go. And the, the old answer that Josh, myself, that we all had was just get a shotgun. You know, the Biden answer, get a shotgun. Two blasts in the air. Take it out of the, take it out of the sky. You and I are not professional skeet shooters. Josh actually went out and bought a DJI drone, and he buzzed himself a couple times with it, and it's changed his entire perspective, uh, especially when it comes to the FPV, those little fast bastards that have the that have RPGs strapped to the bottom of them. You ain't gonna hit it. Any video that you see of people with small arms shooting one out of the sky, there are tens to ten to twenty to a hundred instances of drones being flown into other locations where they are trying to shoot it down. We're going to see one tonight, and they're unsuccessful. The solution to these drones is something much more complex than something as simple as, if you hear it, run. It's going to run you down, quite simply. You are absolutely f***ed if you have a drone climbing up your ass. The footage tells us that. Let's move on, though. Uh, reality of drones on the ground. Let's talk about it. Ex if... Brutal video of Russians on the receiving end of drones attempting to shoot it down and being very not successful doing that. Discretion advised here. Yeah, they tried with rifles. I think a lot of people that, that think that they're... I'm, I'm going to attack all the FUDs in the chat here for a second. Uh, most of you talking about shotguns have never patterned your shotgun before. I'm just going to tell you that right now. right? Because by the time you hear that thing inbound, right, and you shoulder your, your shotgun, uh, you know, chamber it, unless you already have it chambered. Presumably, you already have it chambered. By the time you hear that thing coming you know, come in your direction. Uh, it's probably, what, 20, 30 feet away? They're not loud. These little tiny drones are really not all that loud. And even if you do hear it prior to that, you got to identify it. That's the OODA construct. You know, observe, orient, decide, and act. Your OODA loop is not faster than that drone. So that by the time you observe that drone, orient towards that d drone, decide to, t decide to act against that drone, and then act against it, you're lucky if you're going to hit it. Taking that a step further, even having a shotgun with a good choke with the, with the right load inside of it, that drone's moving like 40 to 50 miles an hour. 
Ducks aren't. I'm I'm just being serious. I I personally cannot see that the that the solution to this is just use a shotgun. Why don't they just use shotguns? I think the solution to this, and I'm I, it's not that I'm trying to be passionate about. It, I'm just being real serious about it. I think the ultimate solution to this is electronic in some fashion, not these handheld drone guns. I'm talking about electronic in the form of the Duke systems that we had, just employed in a different way, maybe man pack of some kind. The Duke system, for those that don't know, was a system to jam receivers for remote controlled IEDs. Fundamentally and conceptually, it, it could theoretically do the same for uh, and we do have programs. There are absolutely counter UAS programs that not a lot of people know about that I don't know enough about to talk about. Um, you know, it's not that I wouldn't talk about them. I just don't know about them. But it, the solution to this is more electronic than anything kinetic in my mind, especially when you took an, look at an economy of scale perspective, right? You, yeah, you can employ CRAM. You know, each CRAM, how, many, how much is that damn thing? That's not cheap to employ a CRAM. Not at all. Anyway, let's move on. Um, I wanted to show this video because I mentioned it earlier, words matter, that we saw a Russian, or ex excuse me, a Ukrainian T-72 that took three FPV drones to take out of action. What you're going to see is reported somewhere near Kupiansk, which is what we just watched. We, the footage we just watched for, was from Kupiansk. I understand that I didn't cover the geolocation. I have it. I have the coordinates. It's in the chat if you want to go take a look at that. This is reported to come from Kupiansk as well. Uh, maybe Sinkivka. Uh, when I say Kupiansk, I don't mean the city because that's pretty far off the, the forward line. But it's reported to show, just to close my thought out, leopards being targeted by FPV drones. Multiple leopards but individual drones, and we don't see any aftermath. Okay, you could jam the drone uh, transmission frequency. Well, you would jam you would jam at the frequency that the the operator is transmitting to the receiver. Right, that that is ultimately the way that would work. You jam receivers, right? So imagine there are two people. The way the way jamming works. Imagine there are two people talking, uh, and you want to stop the message going from Bob to Alice. Well, what you do is you scream in Alice's ear so that she can't hear the message from Bob. Bob is the drone operator. Alice is the drone. You would scream at Alice, you know, stupid lady, just yelling at her, and she can't hear Bob for any instructions on what to do. That is ultimately how jamming works, right? So theoretically, in the way the Duke system worked, and I have videos of me driving around uh, with a Duke sticking out of the top of our vehicle. I, we actually talked about this over on my personal stream Friday. Um, the way the Duke worked is it would jam known frequencies that uh, were being used to control remote-controlled IEDs. In the same vein, there are systems that are being tested and employed now with both kinetic means and electronic means, at least here in the United States, that uh, I, I think not enough people talk about and know about. I definitely don't know enough about them, but we have more capability from a counter UAS perspective, at least in test and employment with, with you know our more premier frontline units. It's not across the force and needs to be. Uh, then, I, then I think we're given credit. Uh, a lot of people talking about what's the U.S. doing for this. There's a lot more. You know, there was a video shared around Twitter uh, just the other day. Let's move uh, to Russia, where the main directorate of intelligence for Ukraine claimed a raid into Belgorod. This raid takes place here. Now, initially, when we start watching this video. Your reaction might be, how the hell do you know it takes place there? Just get, be, pat be patient because you'll end up seeing this, this area very clearly where Ukrainian artillery starts to fall to either cover the operatives as they're moving out or, um, you know, uh, I don't know. They could, they could have extracted and then 
artillery starts falling. But you'll see that as a part of the video. Cam did this right up. And here it is. see that body of water we were looking at earlier here and there's that artillery falling let's bring it up <clears throat> i saw a question in the chat that i think is an interesting one you know something akin to you know what's your take on russia saying we don't have the ability to defeat hypersonic missiles well it depends on what quote hypersonics you're talking about uh if it's the kinzals uh, the patriot has effectively been used to intercept kinzals uh, repeatedly uh it is a repeatable process at this point in 100% is able to do that. Beyond that, there are going to be capabilities that we have, capabilities that we don't have, and then capabilities that we don't have but do. Um, and I don't know what those are. I don't think any of us do. Unless you are watching from the inside of a skiff right now, which, you, I don't know, you might be. Uh, I've heard that before, actually, uh, which is weird. But... Um, unless you are a part of those programs, you're not going to know those capabilities. The same thing with Russia, right? There might be capabilities that Russia has uh, that they're not supposed to have and that nobody knows about. That's literally the, like the definition of national security interests, right? Uh, or, or the things that get classified from a capabilities perspective appear weak when you're strong, etc. So um, there's a lot that we don't know. Um, but based on what's been employed against the systems that we have provided, and in fact, we're going to watch... Uh, this isn't, you know, something to intercept hypersonics, but we're going to watch the Avenger, which is one of our, you know, anti-air systems here in one video. Uh, based on the capabilities that the United States has provided to Ukraine, uh, they've been wildly effective, you know, definitely more effective, you know, than they were originally given credit once they got there. Anyway, uh, speaking of the Avenger, though, coming up for you guys right now, the Avenger uh, is a Humvee with launchers on the back of it, and I want to say it fires Stinger missiles. Uh, please correct me on that in the chat, but here it is. Keep the music off. It is reportedly intercepting a Shahed... Um, Either 136 or 131 here.
Let's get a better view of that launcher. There you are. It does have some self-defense capability as well. But you have four in each pod here of those anti-air missiles. And it's on the back of a Humvee. That's it. Uh, four or eight FIM-1, or excuse me, uh, FIM-92 Stinger missiles. Thank you very much, Bad TV. I thought so. Why is it blurred? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know what would normally be there that is that is blurred now. Not certain. Now, what's interesting though is we see the openings of the launchers blurred as well. I wonder if there is a specific capability that's employed in there, which is one of those things that we don't have, but we do, right? Or that Ukraine doesn't have. But they do. See where I'm going with that? There could there could be a, a, a new variant of missile inside of there. There could be a variant with capabilities beyond uh, known capabilities that Ukraine has in the arms that have been provided. I'm not certain. Uh, I don't know what normally goes here and why that would be blurred out, though. All right. Speaking of U.S. equipment, though. Where are the Abrams at? They're right here. They're not in action, but the M1A1 SA, uh, the second video that I've seen so far in the last two weeks, has once again reared its head. Now, for the M1A1 SA, and I know there were... We've known that this is the variant that they've been go that they were going to receive for quite a while. But it, to be honest with you, it's really not the true M1A1SA variant. The, the true M1A1SA was an upgrade program that they had for original M1A1s to bring it to zero hour capability. Zero hour capability is, hey, we're going to war right now and these tanks need to be able to sustain against a pure adversary and they're too outdated. So what it would typically add is upgraded gunner imagery or imaging systems, um, some up upgraded capabilities uh, with respect to NBC, uh, a digitalized fire control system. Um, oh, and the depleted uranium armor of whatever composition that it is. It would be the third generation DU armor that normally goes on the M1A1 SAs. However, there are there is an export variant of the M1A1 SA that is devoid of that DU armor. In fact, that is used the M1A1 SA that doesn't have the DU armor by Australia, Egypt, Morocco, and Iraq. So, if I understand correctly, that is the variant that Ukraine has here, and those are some of its capabilities. Not very elite until it's shooting at you. <laughs> uh, it's got Gen 2 Gen 2 FLIR inside of it, which from a capabilities perspective is pretty damn good. Uh, you know, it's got a the, the Abrams. If you want to go to Odin Wegg, O-D-I-N space W-E-G. Um, the Odin Wegg is something that I use pretty regularly to better understand uh, when I get the time to dive down into you know, different munitions and armament. Um, but it... it, it it is the Worldwide Equipment Guide. Uh, it's housed by the DOD, right? So it is a .mil website. But you can search any piece of equipment in there, and it'll give you specs all the way down to, you know, effective range, what type of munitions um, or, or uh, armament it has, uh, at least within the realm of what is publicly releasable. Because, again, there's going to be stuff that we know that we're not supposed to know. Uh, there's stuff that Russia knows that they're not supposed to know. That's how the whole shadow game works. That's how it all works. Anyway, I got another cool piece of tech here to show you. A little, a little while ago, we watched a video, and we're coming up towards the end of the stream here. This is, this is actually the last bit of combat footage we have. But a little while ago, we watched this cool video of, well, mind-blowing video, of a drone that they were putting anti-tank mines in and dropping those out of it. And, you know, it was kind of 
kind of made you clinch up a bit because, you know, it showed it sitting on the ground with everybody standing around it and it dropped an anti-tank mine. I hadn't yet seen footage of that. This is the vampire drone. Uh, and this is that being used uh, to drop anti-tank mines on uh, Russian vehicles. Like anti-tank mines. You can just barely see it. See it flipping? Looks like a disc flying through there because it is. It's an anti-tank mine being dropped from a drone on vehicles. Oh, we're watching it again. All right, let's bring it back up. Checking in on the support, and thank you guys for it. Mission your mom. Thanks for the five bucks. We can train falcons to catch drones. I'll volunteer for that, but how scalable is that? Right? How? how I know that I understand there's a lot of falcons, but the capability to, to the counter UAS capability has to go all the way down to the team level, right? So is every team gonna have a falcon? Like, is there just the falcon guy? Because I mean, it sounds dope. And I'm way into it, but I don't know that that is scalable at that level, right? When it comes to like a man pack system, right? It's more obviously going to be more costly, but that is something that's scalable. You got your RTO uh, and you got your counter US guy, counter UAS guy. Uh, each of them has a man portable, uh, you know, capability. They run it on their back. You know, typically going to be, you know, PFC, something, something along those lines, stays tied to the commander, right? It'll have to be the commander, you know, platoon sergeant, platoon leader, whoever, will have to take into account, you know, we're, we're sending a team outside of our, you know, counter UAS capability. Again, I think, I think the, the I, I'm not smart enough to know what the best solution for this is, but I think it has to be electronic. I honestly do. Now, you can then supplement that electronic capability uh, with kinetics, with um, and there's a program that's out there that actually has, you know, uh, Vortex makes a scope that will auto fire for you. There's a program in the military that is working on an optic that can, and they demonstrated on video, it was floating around Twitter like last week, that demonstrated on video that this optic can identify the drone, track its, you know, erratic movements and fire for you, right? So you can supplement with that I, I, but I think the margin for error on that is so much lower than this umbrella of jamming capability. Now, what you end up needing is all of your other functions. So everybody likes to make fun of the Intel guy, but where do you think you're getting your frequencies? You're getting those frequencies through your Intel team's understanding of the employment of the, the TTPs by the adversary. So, you know, say for instance, there's message traffic that indicates, hey, the adversary is changing their TTPs to use this frequency instead of that one. We load that into the man pack, you know, dude that you have aligned against that squad and you're defended against it. If for some reason you encounter a frequency outside of that, you have supplementing capabilities. Again, I think I think the issue isn't any one thing that, you, that you're going to employ. It's going to have a basis in electronics with supplement supplementary um <clears throat> capabilities that are con more kinetic patriot thank you for the two dollars and that's coming from a position of ignorance no idea no idea i mean i have some idea of like what our current capabilities are but no idea what the the leading quote solution is from at least my country yours might be different there are people from all walks of the world in the chat right now Patriot James, thank you for the $2. Appreciate your knowledge and commentary. You, we don't know what we don't know. And every time I learn something uh, new, I realize how much I still don't know, right? Chad, thank you for the five bucks. Remember that Discovery Show Future Weapons had something called Metal Storm that shot a wall of lead at once. That's your kinetic answer for drones. How scalable is that, right? And how long does it take to reload it? What if you miss, 
All right, I understand it's a wall, but you know, if that thing's moving, you know, 40 miles an hour this way and you don't get that lead right, do you re how do you reload it? I don't know. I think we have to take a lot of a lot of the human out of the equation for counter UAS. I, I, I honestly think we'll have to do that. Uh, Dbag175, thanks very much for the $10. Thanks, man. Always excited when you come on. I appreciate you. I, I honestly do. Even those that come in the chat to be an asshole, you know, I appreciate you guys stopping by, right? It does uh, It does help for me to, to see there are going to be things that, you know, I personally say that you don't agree with. I'm not, I'm not trying in 99% of circumstances to lead you somewhere. I'm giving you my understanding of the video that we're looking at at that time. I'm not here to, to, to give you the news if by function of being here at some point you're able to gather a better understanding of what's happening worldwide. That's, that's the best I could ask for. So I do appreciate you guys. And I got, two, I got two more videos. I couldn't decide which one of these I wanted to run tonight. So you're going to have to bear with me for two ending videos this evening. The very first, well, technically this one could just be out of Ukraine. We'll just we'll say that this one's a part of the Ukraine video. A rocket propelled grenade without the propel doesn't really do its job well. Bloop. That wasn't even a, like a good bloop. That that was a uh, explosion. That was a that was a bad bloop. That's the bloop that you don't want. <laughs> All right. So that was that was the last Ukraine video that I have for you guys tonight. But I always have one more video for you. This will be that video. I'm going to be departing to go kick back, play some games, um, chat. Uh, the stream will redirect you over there if you want to be a part of it. You're welcome. You know, we raise money for veteran charity over there. So if you'd like to be a part of that, we'd love to have you. Uh, thank you for all of the additional support that's coming in towards the end of the stream here. Archeezy, thank you for the $20. Theocracy Sean, thank you for the $10. Do you think a nuke will be used in either war? No, I don't. Um, you know, we've kind of talked about that, especially when the war got started. Uh, it's mutually assured destruction. The outlier is when people feel like they get backed into a corner, they do really dumb shit. But anyway, good night. This is your last video. Brought to you by the car dealership, Isis Toyota. Stay informed. Hello, I'm Bob Isis of Isis Toyota. And we have a great collection of pre-owned certified Toyota. Hello, I'm Bob Isis of Isis Toyota. And we have a great collection of pre-owned certified Toyota. Hello, I'm Bob Isis. It... <sighs> Good night. Of Isis Toyota. And we have a great collection of pre-owned certified Toyota.